This is Kathy Bogan for Consortium News, and I'm here with Greg Barnes, an Australian lawyer for Julian Assange. Greg, the US has just given two assurances for Julian Assange, one in relation to constitutional rights he may have if extradited to the United States, and the other in relation to the death penalty. The first assurance seems deceptive because it says he may seek to rely specifically on the First Amendment, but that it is up to the US judiciary to decide whether it can be applied. What the US is not saying, however, is that it is a matter of long established law, as stated by Judge Kavanaugh in the 2020 USAID versus Open Society case in the Supreme Court. And there are reportedly many other precedents that foreign nationals acting abroad don't have any constitutional rights. This would cause the immediate barring of Julian's First Amendment protection purely on grounds of nationality. And this, according to former British Ambassador Craig Murray, is what breaks Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. It also seems to violate Section 81 of the UK's Domestic Extradition Act, which is a bar on extradition related to various forms of discrimination, including nationality. Is it time for Australia to tell the US executive that its assurance does not assure because the judiciary will say it can't and either insist on the case being sent to the European Court of Human Rights to decide on the Article 10 issue or just drop the charges as per their domestic legislation because they've hit a brick wall with the UK's demand that Julian will not be, quote, potentially very greatly prejudiced on grounds of his nationality. Well, look, Cathy, firstly, thanks very much for having me uh, again. There are a range of issues that make the assurances that have been given by the United States unsatisfactory. Um, I'm not going to enter into the Article 10 argument uh, because there are those with greater expertise who can talk to you about it, and I know will talk to you about it and have talked to you about it. What I will talk about, though, is the fact that the difficulty with these assurances is that's all they are. They don't have the force of law. It's not, a, it's not like a contract. Um, where uh, you can sue the other party for a breach. Here you have assurances that are given, and as you rightly point out in your opening, um, one of the difficulties with one of the assurances is that it's simply designed, uh, if it worked at all, to give Julian the right to apply to use the First Amendment defence in a US court. And, of course, the British government, the British courts, and the executive arm of the US government can't bind a US court. It's a matter for that court to determine that application. And that court might say yes, it might say no. So it's an assurance that really is not an assurance. I mean, it, it's something that could be said any day of the week to a person in Julian's position, but it wouldn't mean anything. So, that, you know, that's a real difficulty. I, I think the other issue is that, as the Prime Minister, uh, Anthony Albanese, has said on a number of occasions, enough is enough. And but, you know, that needs now to be translated into extremely forceful uh, language and actions on the part of the Australian government. Um, you have here an Australian citizen who faces the risk of a lifetime and more in the US prison system for revealing what the world needs to know, and that is that war crimes were committed and other nefarious activities, and activities committed by the United States and its allies in theatres of war. It's, a, it's As we know and we've said many times, this is a case which is a threat to freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Um, and it's not simply making representations to the US that's good enough. What needs to happen is that uh, the government needs to make this an alliance issue. It needs to be saying, we are your strongest ally in the Asia-Pacific region in particular. This goes to what we represent and you represent in terms of that alliance. That is give and take. Yes, but surely we shouldn't have to be asking for a favour. The problem essentially is that an American citizen could get away with this and be protected, such as John Young from Cryptome would be protected if they actually decided to charge him because he is an American citizen living and acting in the United States. This law, which 
Kevin assures us is long established, makes it clear in more detail that foreign nationals may be accorded constitutional rights if they reside in the United States. However, journalists who live abroad and who are not American citizens are at ultimate risk. And this just doesn't seem to be a fair, any potential of a fair trial if Julian's going to be knocked back on that question of his First Amendment rights simply because he's an Australian, because he's a foreign national and he did act abroad. I mean, in a way, doesn't this actually challenge the Espionage Act and its jurisdiction? Well, one of the concerns about this case has always been that you've got the use of a US domestic law, the Espionage Act, being used to drag into the American courts and punish within the American court system. An individual who, one, is not a US citizen and two, did not when these materials were published or was not in the United States. The, the risk is that if the United States is successful in this case, it will continue to use this particular precedent to go after other journalists and publishers, including those in Australia. Australia has recently criticised China for the imposition of security laws which uh, purport to have extraterritorial reach, in fact. They do have extraterritorial reach. So you can't, on the one hand, criticise China for uh, legislation which has, has this sort of extraterritorial reach in terms of freedom of speech, and on the other hand, allow the US to get away with it. As And that's why I said earlier, you know, this is a bedrock principle. This is about these core values that the alliance pretends to stand for. That is liberal democracy, the rule of law, and embedded within those is, of course, the notion of freedom of the press and freedom of speech and, in particular, transparency. Yes, but even if China, too, has extraterritorial reach, it may have very similar laws where it affords more protection to its own citizens, but it doesn't afford that protection to foreigners. This applies to anyone, not just Julian Assange. Of course, a lot of the time people are extradited for violent crimes, for murder, for terrorism. But this is a case of publishing and it relates to very strongly to what has been described as the crown jewel in the American constitution. And surely Australia has to say something about our citizen if he is going to be able to be grabbed and prosecuted by the United States, but not afforded the same protections as they afford to their own citizens. This is an offence to our nation and the allegiance between us. Well, there's no doubt about that, Cathy, and that's what I've said this afternoon to you in this interview, that it is an offence. Uh, it's an offensive action on the part of the United States. If China took this action, Russia took this action, there would be all hell to pay. And the Australian media would swing behind every Australian politician and say, we have to move heaven and earth to get this person out. That hasn't happened in the Assange case until more recently when you're now seeing momentum, I think, irreversible momentum now towards there being some form of deal or agreement and Julian being able to leave with the charges dropped with guaranteed that he won't be pursued again and allowed to get on with his life. Yeah. But I think even the, the British recognise that everyone should be treated equally by the law. And that is why, even though if they don't have that bar on political offences in their extradition treaty, the 2007 version they did before, but if they don't have it there, they do have this point that is in their domestic legislation where they don't want people prejudiced against because of their race, gender, religion or nationality. So wouldn't you agree that the UK has to, has to say no, you can't do it because it's wrong, but they have been so favourable, let's say, to put it mildly, to the United States and very unfavourable to the defence. Do you fear that the UK also could ignore its own domestic legislation, having 
the head of the King's Bench, Dame Victoria Sharp, say, we demand that he will not be prejudiced on grounds of his nationality. Can they backtrack now and say, oh, yeah, this assurance looks OK? <laughs> yes. What uh, the court said was that there were, I think there were originally nine grounds of appeal. It wasn't going to take up six, but in relation to three, it offered the opportunity to the United States to provide will provide assurances. I think there were three. Uh, one is the issue of the death penalty. Uh, the second is the issue of the First Amendment. Uh, and the third is that he won't be treated less favourably in circumstances where he's not a US citizen. The court will have a very good look at these assurances. I mean, it did so in the UK Supreme Court, which is equivalent to the High Court in Australia in a case involving Rwanda. That was a case involving a challenge to the UK's so-called solution which was to send those coming on boats seeking asylum to Rwanda. And what the court said there was that mere assurances given by Rwanda aren't sufficient, that you've got to look behind those assurances and see what's happening and see whether they're real or not and they can be enforced. And that, of course, no doubt will be a live issue when the matter goes back to court in May. Well, one would hope so. I did ask Craig Murray, who wrote extensively about the AAA, versus Home Secretary, landmark decision by the Supreme Court stating that assurances must now be tested in a court of law against the evidence. And it is not simply up to the Home Secretary to say that a country is safe. But he wasn't quite sure that this had changed anything in the case of Julian Assange and this particular, it should. But uh, the facts are that the assurances are going to be discussed in the courtroom on May 20th. The US has replied, as it had to do by the 16th of April. The defence has now until the 30th of April to enter submissions. And then the US again can enter submissions until May 14th. Yeah. Um, and then it'll be nutted out in court, as it should be. I'd just like to ask you what you think of the death penalty assurance. Is that solid in your view? Well, again, I mean, you can't bind a court. Uh, if a court decides to impose a death penalty, it will. Um, you know, having said that, um, the suggestion in this case has been up to 170 years prison, which, of course, is an effective death penalty. So uh, that that still remains on the table. And I think that's still an issue that if you got a sentence like that, even a sentence of 50 or 60 years would be a death penalty in this particular case because it's an effective death penalty. It means that you have lost your freedom for the rest of your life. And, and that remains a real issue in this case. Well, I think Stella mentioned three ways that Julian could die. And of course, I was saying to Craig Murray that it's such a shame that these judges keep changing all the time because it's a little bit like not having a family doctor. You go to a new one and they don't know anything about you. They didn't seem to know much about this case, the renewal appeal judges. They had some talking points, but one very important testimony that they missed was that of Maureen Baird, who made it clear that Julian would not be getting put into safe hands by handing him over to the justice system yeah. in the United States and that Julian would simply refuse that. I mean, even if you look at the medical expert testimony, uh, once Julian learns that his extradition is imminent and that's when he's still in the UK, he's going to end it. He's not going to allow the CIA to determine, which is what Maureen Baird told us, the regime of incarceration and find a way to impose Sam's a living hell, this kind of extreme torture yep. for the rest of his days. He's not going to accept it. So we're looking at suicide and he was deemed to be a moderate to high suicide risk by all four of the medical experts on both yep. sides. Yes. Yep. That's right. And look, you know, the bottom line on it is this, Cathy, there is simply no public interest in continuing to pursue this case. Zero. And, uh, you know, that whether you're a conservative MP in Australia or on the left, uh, most politicians in this country agree. 
uh, very few who don't. The White House needs to listen to that message, very, very unambiguous message from its key ally, Asia Pacific. Yeah. Do the right thing, drop these charges and drop them now. Well, one could argue that for the Biden administration, which is not doing terribly well in the polls at the moment because of what's happening in Gaza, that's not making Biden very popular and it's really damaging his chances of getting re-elected. So one could argue that there is a political interest in dropping these charges because that will wash some of the mud off him. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, you know, I got no doubt that if you look at a read on American politics, the left of the Democratic Party is very unhappy with Joe Biden over Israel, as they should be. And this does give some comfort if he does, as he should, the right thing on Julian Assange. Well, this is true. Well, we just have to wait and see once again and hope that the right thing is done. Thank you very much, Greg Barnes, for talking to us today. We much Thank appreciate you, your learned opinion. Anytime. Thank you. Bye.